Welcome to a discussion with Alexander Dörg regarding artificial dynamical effects in quantum field theory. We're going to be talking about how to quantize quantum field theory in different approaches and the benefits and drawbacks associated with each choice. So I hope you enjoy that. As a sort of intro to this in the paper, you're raising the example of fictitious forces in Newtonian mechanics. Um, would you mind giving some background to, to what that is and what the similarities are between that and what we will be talking about in the paper? Sure. So the what we called um, artificial forces or pseudo forces or uh, inertial forces, there's a bunch of names for them, are, um, are effects that happen when you're uh, looking at a system in a non-inertial frame. So um, inertial frames are are the, the basics of uh, classical mechanics, Newton mechanics. They they are frames that are um, uh, either at rest if you're in the frame or moving at a constant speed compared to, uh, to the frame where you're at rest. And that's where you have the simplest description of, uh, of, 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 of the, the physics. Uh, but, you know, the frame is a choice of, uh, the choice of frame is a human decision. So we, we may decide to take, to take another frame. And if this frame is not moving at a constant speed compared to, to, to a frame of, of reference, uh, then you will have extra effect, uh, inertial effect that will uh, that will occur. And maybe the best known of such effect is the centrifugal forces. Um, mm. If uh, if you're uh, ana analyzing a problem in uh, in a rotating frame, um, you 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 feel or oh, it looks like you have uh, some extra force uh, which uh, goes by the name of uh, centrifugal forces, which is really due to um, the, the the propensity of object to to retain their inertia. That's why we call them inertial inertial forces because the the, the deep origin of a force such as the centrifugal force is the conservation of uh, uh, momentum. Uh, so those those forces have been um, you know <laughs> known for hundreds of years, um, and they they. Ultimately, if you if you try to to understand them in terms of uh, symmetry of nature, they they appear when you're analyzing a problem that uh, that break the the symmetry of uh, of space time of classical space time. So, um, the, by by that I mean that um, in classical mechanics. We know that if you're analyzing in a, a problem in a, in a given in a given frame, and then you take another frame that is either at rest compared to it or at uh, moving at uh, a constant speed, then the physics description is the same, and that's what we call Galilean invariance. So yes. if you analyze uh, your problem respecting Galilean invariance, you always have the same type of description. You don't have uh, pseudo forces, uh, inertial forces. And that's what people usually do because that's the easiest, and uh, and you don't have to deal with those those uh, pseudo effect. Uh, but if you analyze it in a in a framework that break uh, the Galilean invariance, then you need to account for those extra forces, which sometimes is easy, and sometimes it's not. So usually the recommendation is to always do your uh, analysis in, a, in an inertial frame, in a Galilean frame. So that you mm -hmm. you deal with the simplest problem. So this is you know you probably remember that from your uh, days at uh, at school. Uh, this is well known. Uh, but what the paper is about is that we have uh, some some type of formal analogy between such uh, pseudo effect that happen in classical mechanics and uh, similar effect that happen in quantum field theory. So. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe it's useful if I give a, a short uh, explanation of what is quantum field theory. Uh, yes, or, please do. Uh, yeah. So um, I, I was so far talking about classical mechanics. Um, that's uh, how we view the world, <laughs> world uh, several centuries ago. Now we, we have a, we had a, a couple of revolutions that told us this was not the, the final. Uh, way of uh, of describing the world we had the uh, first revolution from einstein that 
told us that uh, the Newtonian mechanics, Newtonian physics needs to be uh, modified, especially when uh, when we're looking at at a system of uh, high speed. So that was the first revolution that overthrew the uh, classical Newtonian mechanics. Then the other uh, revolution was quantum mechanics. So those, those two advance in our understanding of, of nature were kind of independent. But if you consider systems that um, are very small, so that depend on, uh, on that, that are in the quantum world, and also that involve particle that goes very far, who are, also, uh, who are then in the, in, the relativist, in the relativistic world, then you need to combine those two revolutions into one framework, and this framework is uh, quantum field theory. So quantum field theory is basically um, quantum mechanics uh, at a relativistic level. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what it is, and that's our, uh, so uh, as far as we know, uh, it's our best description of nature to date. We that you know, it works really well. Uh, we we have not seen much uh, a hint for uh, what would replace our. Uh, or description of the world uh, using quantum field theory. We expect it's not the final description, but uh, it's really, really, really good. And uh, when we try to see beyond that, it's, it's really hard to, to know what uh, what can replace that. So that's what we're using in, uh, in uh, for example, particle physics. And uh, the, the equivalent of the Galilean symmetry of classical mechanic in um, in uh, quantum field theory is Poincaré symmetry. So Galilean uh, symmetry, Galilean invariance, was uh, a reflection of um, symmetries of of uh, of nature of space. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, if you analyze something here and then you move uh, somewhere there, uh, then uh, the law of physics should not change. Or if you analyze something in a frame and then you analyze it the same thing, but in a frame that moves at constant speed, it, it should not change. So that's that's those Galilean symmetry of nature. Uh, if you look at, uh, if you go into the quantum and relativistic frame, especially the relativistic frame, uh, it's it, it's becoming a little more complicated, and it's not Galilean invariance that you have anymore. It's Poincaré invariance, and this uh, is a set of ten symmetry of of nature. So um, what we do with uh, our standard approach of uh, quantum field theory is analyzing our, our system in a way that breaks Poincaré invariance. And uh, because of that, just, just like when we break uh, Galilean symmetry, we, we have to deal with non-fundamental artificial uh, effect. When we break Poincaré symmetry, doing an uh, analysis of problem in quantum field theory, we also uh, create uh, the same type of uh, artificial dynamical effect. And um, um, this this view was, was not very, uh, how to say, well known until until we, we put this, this paper out. And that, that was the goal of the paper to to show that uh, there was a, a formal um, analogy between something that was very well known in, uh, in uh, classical Newtonian mechanics and what we're doing in um, currently in quantum field theory. Mm -hmm. so okay. Yeah. W would you mind elaborating a little bit on what it is exactly that we do in quantum field theory or in the analysis of quantum field theory that breaks this invariance? So. <laughs> In the classical case, it was quite clear, right? We're introducing this uh, reference frame that mm -hmm. is moving, so to speak, or that has a, um, in the case of the centrifugal force, like a, a circular um, motion. What are we doing in the case of quantum field theory that uh, breaks this, yeah, this symmetry? So, um, what we're doing is that we're uh, we're we're choosing a time to to show all things are evolving. So for example, you, you know, you're looking at a, an, at a particle physics experiment, you have a particle coming in, uh, hitting another particle, you look at the product of this, uh, this reaction, what you want to, to know is 
how the system has evolved from the start to the end. And for that, you need to choose a time. So when you, when you do classical physics, uh, the, the time is, you know, the Newtonian time, there's no, no choice. It's well defined. There's only one. Uh, but, uh, starting with, uh, Einstein and Minkowski, uh, we realize time is, um, it is relative and there's not a unique choice of time. Uh, you, you can, you can, you can choose, um, you can choose, you, you have, the, you're free to choose a, a different type of time. So, uh, it is best put by looking at, uh, not as space plus time, uh, as two distinct, uh, entities, but, and that's what, that was the, the big input of Minkowski, Minkowski at the beginning of the relativistic uh, revolution. You actually should consider, uh, the whole thing together, space time. And when you consider space time, if you want to choose a time, you can, uh, you can choose it in any way you wish. Uh, so the, the usual analogy is that uh, you have a loaf of bread and um, you want to slice it in uh, in different uh, slices and each slice is represent a, a time. And you're free to to cut your bread vertically or, uh, or slanted or more slanted. Each angle you choose gives you a different, def uh, uh, a different definition of time. So, um, as, as long as, as soon as you, you choose such a definition, then you break Poincaré invariance because Poincaré symmetry is the symmetry of, uh, the space time itself in four dimension. Okay. So as soon as you want to give a, a description of what is happening in terms of time, a description of the evolution of the, the system, what, what we call the, the dynamical, uh, a dynamical description of the system, or how it evolves, uh, you have to break Poincaré invariance. There's no way around, right? You have to choose the time. And, um, and there's a, uh, a standard way to do that, which is to choose what we call the Galilean time. And that tend to break, to break, uh, Poincaré invariance with consequences. But then there's another way to do this, and that was something that was uh, pointed out by uh, uh, Paul Dirac uh, almost 80 years ago. He pointed out that if you choose a specific uh, definition of time, then you minimize the consequences of breaking Poincaré invariance. So you minimize the rise of all those um, artificial effects. So it's yeah. something that has been uh, known, as I said, for, for 80 years, but somehow this choice of time is less intuitive. It is you know, producing uh, a framework that is less intuitive because we are used to the Galilean time. Uh, we, we understand it very well. Dirac is telling us to choose a different type of time, which is called the light from time, which is less intuitive. So, you know, it's a, it's kind of a step to, uh, to get into this framework. And, uh, our impression uh, is that, um, the, this step is, 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 uh, is a big, bit of a too big step for, for people to take, despite the big advantage that you have at the end. So you, you lose a bit of intuition at the beginning, which you will requ re require with time. But, uh, at the beginning, you, you lose a bit of intuition. You know, things are, uh, are, are kind of, uh, weird <laughs> with this time. Uh, but then at the end, uh, you, you really simplify, uh, your, your problem by essentially doing the equivalent of working in an inertial frame. When if you use the, the standard method, uh, the Galilean time, you will have to deal with the equivalent of all those, uh, inertial effect. So that's, that's the origin of the problem. That's what we do in quantum field theory. We have to, to slice space time and that can create problem and Dirac told us there's a good way of doing this, but somehow we are not doing it very often. And the paper was you know, try to give a perspective of, you know, why we should do it and uh, what, what are the benefits of, uh, of doing it. Mm -hmm. Is there some intuition you could give for, uh, maybe the definition of the light from time. So we have this different notion of time where we have some degree of freedom, at least in how we choose to define it. Are you able to say something about how this specific time that we're now choosing 
um, differs from the Galilean one? So um, maybe maybe it's good if you if you move uh, on the paper to the to one of the figure um, mm -hmm. because it, it it shows the definition and I have the paper with me too. Right. So uh -huh. in uh, in in figure four, um, you can see on on the left um, um, the, the the standard frame. So you have uh, the time going up, uh, mm -hmm. the direction going to the left, and um, and it's only in two D uh, two dimension uh, in in one spatial dimension and one uh, one time dimension. So we so that we can draw, we we make the full space time. Uh, reduced to two, so that we can make mm -hmm. uh, we can make a picture. So uh, the what Dirac is telling us is that uh, it's advantageous to define the time as a combination of uh, of uh, the space z and the time t, so that mm -hmm. uh, it's pointing along what we call the light cone. So the the light cone is uh, is, is one of the basics of uh, of special relativity. It, it tells you basically what are the, the trajectory of uh, of of light particle of photon and the, the light cone can be seen on the, on the left picture uh, as the dashed uh, as the dashed line that's what we call mm -hmm. the light cone and Dirac is telling us well if you choose your time along one of those lines and then your space along the the other line then uh, you would minimally you know, your, your consequences of breaking Poincaré invariance will be minimal. And that's illustrated uh, on the right figure. So you, you see the, the light font time is what we call tau, the, you know, the, the 45 yeah. degree arrow, uh, uh, the, the, the arrow pointing at minus 45 degree uh, to the left. That's, uh, that's the, the light font time. And then the light mm -hmm. font space is uh, what we call X minus uh, never mind why it's called x minus that's that's the space dimension um, uh, in in the light font so uh, the um, maybe a, a way to to see what uh, what the light font time is is simply to say the, the time that is defined on the on the on the by the side of the line cone just one follow-up question then on the definition, uh, or rather the, the illustration that we see here. So not only are we defining or redefining our uh, time, so to speak, in the new basis that we choose, but we're also redefining then our spatial dimensions to still create an orthonormal basis. Is that the, <laughs> is that the reason why this new uh, space dimension is altered as well? Oh, yes, yes. Um... You, you know, as soon as you select a time, regardless of what you do, regardless of whether you choose a, a Galilean time or a, or a light font time, you have also to redefine space, right? It, remember mm -hmm. the, the loaf of bread, right? Uh, if, yeah. if, you, you, if you cut it one way, it will affect the, the other dimension. Mm -hmm. So, and that, okay. that's valid for, uh, that, that's always, always valid, not just light font. Uh, mm -hmm. Because you you know your four dimensional space is one thing, so if you slice it one way, you affect all the dimension. Yeah. So I, I I should have been clearer. It, it's true. Once you, you know, it's not just the time you choose. You you also the consequence is that you're also redefining the space at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's always true. Uh huh. All right. So this is the. Uh, for, from my perspective, the intuition behind what we're trying to do is clear. We're rearranging the the bases such that they align with the light cone. Um, if we talk about quantization now and what the effects are of taking the approach on the right hand side here compared to the one on the left hand side, what are then the the results of this? If we get into the details there, so uh, it's uh, there there are very big consequences and uh, this this. Um actually is a good illustration of it. Uh, so that there's, uh, there's, there's several ways to, uh, to quantify uh, nature. Uh, typically, we, we say quantify field because the way we describe nature nowadays is uh, uh, with, with fields, right? So uh, in the jargon, we say there's uh, several ways to, to quantify fields. Um, and there's 
something that is called uh, the canonical way because that's what has been done <laughs> first and also no. uh, what you most of the time find in the textbook uh, and uh, this this way is based on Hamiltonian physics. So what um, your uh, you know you start from an Hamiltonian describing your field and, uh, and 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 using this you quantify them. But there's another way to quantify a field which is called the path integral way. Uh, but uh, it's uh, it's 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 something very different. And we're we're really you know, what, what we're here. Talking about is the, the canonical quantization. Uh, all this discussion is not is not directly connected to the, the path integral method. So that's just to clarify that that we're, we're discussing within the, the canonical quantization framework. So when uh, when you quantize your your field using the, the canonical uh, method, you you uh, you set up um, commuta commutation relation between quantities and those are done uh, at equal time to uh, to uh, ensure uh, causality uh, and so when you do it uh, with um, with the, the Galilean time you you end up with the the, the standard way of, of doing quantum um, quantum field theory, and when you quantize them uh, using uh, life, life on time, then you end up with a, a different theory uh, that, that allows you to, to describe nature. And at the end, as I said, it's a human choice. So you, at the end, if, if you do all the calculation correctly, you should end up with the same answer, regardless of def what definition of time and space you chose, mm -hmm. uh, but in practice, it's uh, this has consequences because uh, you may your, your choice of, uh, of of time in your quantization may complicate or simplify the problem. And uh, the argument uh, that that we're making in this paper is that if you choose right from time, uh, it's it's uh, you end up with a uh, uh, Usually, much simpler problem to solve, and it's you know it's not a, a discovery. That's something that uh, uh, pe people that have been working with the light front have been advocating for for decades. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. that's that's one thing we try to explain in uh, in an intuitive way in the paper. And um, so, what you see here on the on the graph is uh, um, something that is a consequence of uh, commutation relation. So uh, a direct consequence of commutation commutation relation uh, uh, commutation relation is uh, the the famous uh, uncertainty principle of Heisenberg, and uh, so it tells you that if you have uh, two conjugate quantity like uh, space uh, z here and uh, and momentum, um, you can't determine them with uh, infinite accuracy at the same time. So that's, that's the, the Heisenberg uncertainty. And in, uh, in, 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 uh, in the standard method, um, the, the uncertainty on space would, would happen at, at, um, at fixed um, Galilean time. Uh, so you, you see the, the, the time is here. So fixed time is, uh, is a line perpendicular to, to, to the space direction. And uh, and that's that's why you would have your uncertainty in position. Uh, okay, in, so the uncertainty here is this delta delta, delta, delta z. z exactly. Um, well, if you quantize um, um, following the light from time, your delta here it's called delta x because of space is called x for uh, just historical reason. Uh, but your uh, your um, your uncertainty now will be uh, slanted at forty five degree, and this has very big consequences um, because uh, if you if you maybe recall your uh, your your, uh, your courses of uh, special relativity, you know that you can define uh, space time into regions that are called time like where things are causal and space like where things are 
uh, cannot propagate because uh, that would be uh, an acosal um, an acosal event, um, and what the, 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 this uh, this graph is showing is that because uh, of uh, of the uncertainty, um, an event that pro propagates from event one to event two, so something that propagates from from event one to event two, that should be allowed to propagate uh, without problem uh, because it's in the time-like time -like region. Uh, so that, that would not, you know, basically if you propagate in the time-like region, you go below the speed of light, uh, which is uh, what you need to do as far as we know. Uh, so that, uh, that that's a perfectly fine propagation. However, if you propagate in the space-like region, uh, you, you can see that uh, if you if you're uh, propagated at a very shallow angle here, that means you're uh, you're uh, going very fast because you 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 know you cover a, long, uh, a lot of distance in a little time, and with the unit that that we typically choose, uh, this 45 degree line is the speed of light. So the, the bottom line is that bottom line is that things can propagate. In time like time like region because they they are going at less than the speed of light, but in principle they are not allowed to propagate at, in the space like region because that would require uh, going moving faster than speed of light. But okay. you can see that uh, because of the uncertainty principle, uh, you you may you may think your event would stay in the time like region even if it propagate at. Uh, Below the, the the speed of light, but it it can, it can actually leak into the space-like region, and uh, this has important consequences on the uh, for, for the for the quantum field theory. On the other hand, if you look at the left, uh, the right plot, the, the right plot, you can see that uh, with light font, it, it never leaks into the the forbidden region, and uh, yeah. that that's why the, the description is much simpler because as soon as you leak into the space-like region, then you start to have some acosal event that 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 arise in the theory, and you need to compensate them with some other mechanism so that at the end you end up with a, a causal theory and nothing that that looked like it had propagated faster than the than the than the, the speed of light. So uh, this this illustrates. Uh, why quantization at uh, at um, mm. light font time simplify greatly the the description because we, we keep everything in the causal region. Mm -hmm. Okay, what would be uh, so you described it briefly, but what would be in maybe a bit more detail uh, the kind of compensations you would need to do if you're acting in uh, in the Galilean approach to, or sorry, in the uh, canonical approach to quantization here on the left. So you have this spillover, and uh, granted, if you have something here that would indicate that this particle or whatever it is propagated faster than speed of light, so that's in violation. Um, how do you? How would you deal with that from a, a like the perspective of the current framework? If you had to operate under this, no. So what? What uh, the consequence of this is that you need to add, as I as I mentioned, you need to add some extra mechanism to kind of compensate for this uh, uh, unwanted uh, event, and um, the the best uh, the the short answer is that uh, you need to to have a, a, a complex structure of the the space, the vacuum of the space in which the the, the particle propagate. So the um, in in classical physics, vacuum is vacuum. There's nothing there. Uh, but in mm -hmm. in quantum field theory, uh, vacuum may be um, a, a complex system, and the the usual way to describe it is that, although when you look at it, it looks like it's it's empty of it, of of everything you can observe. In reality, you have um, quantum loops of of particle and antiparticle that appear and that annihilate really quickly, so you can't see them. So what you think of the of the vacuum is actually a very complex uh, medium filled with those um, loops of uh, virtual particle. 
Um, and, uh, and, and this is basically what we need if you, if we choose, if we choose the Galilean time to compensate for the, the, the leakage of, uh, of, of, of event inside the, the space-like region. So if you want a, a bit more detail on, on this, you can uh, go up to the, the, fig the figure three and I, I, I can explain a little, in a little more detail. So, sure. so in figure three, you, you see here, this is the, the, the with the, you know, the, the standard the, the the standard method um you you have an event uh e1 uh, so a starting point e1 thank you um and then you have an ending point uh e2 and we have to imagine here we, we should have we should have uh, drawn it but you have to imagine the, the 45 degree line that delimited the the the, the time like region to the space like region and here e2 is in this the space-like region. Now, okay. if you go to another frame that is um, moving at constant speed, speed compared to this frame, um, and to move from such frame to another frame, that's what we call the boost. It's a technical term to say I'm, I'm moving from one initial, initial frame to another initial frame. So the technical term is boost. That's why we have this name here. Uh, uh, the way to represent the the, or the 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 direction of the of the moving frame would be uh, given by uh, the, the the blue arrow here t prime and z prime. So when you when you boost a frame, uh, basically what you do is you rotate t one way and and z the other way. Okay, so it's uh, it again that's that's something. Uh, uh, just just uh, standard relativistic uh, mechanics and is but, there some sorry for interrupting here but is there some yeah. intuition for why that happened uh it's uh, it's um I, I i don't have any i mean the the you know it, it's all all this dead back from the, the day of minkowski so 120 yeah. years ago and uh, Minkowski s simply said that uh, when you when you you know go to another frame, uh, you you make a rotation in space time, uh, and it's uh, there's no mystery there. Uh, if you if you work out the math, it's, it's it, the math. It's it's quite simple. Uh, why why it turned out to be a, a, a rotation? Uh, well, it's clear with the math, but uh, is is there some deep <laughs> deep the prison for that, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think so. I've, maybe there's, mm -hmm. there's one. I don't know. Um, okay. Yeah, but uh, anyway, sorry for it, interrupting. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a good question. So if you, yeah, if you, if you move to a frame that, that is, um, uh, if you go to a frame that is moving compared to this T Z frame, then the, the, the frame is kind of, you know, squish, uh, um, toward the, the 45 degree line that, that, uh, gives you the, the speed of, uh, the trajectory of a photon. And the, the, the thing that you see here is that before E2 was above the, you know, above the Z axis, but now as with the, the rotation of the, 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 this, the, the space axis, E2 is below it. Um, mm -hmm. and which means that when you look at what time is associated with E2, to do that, you need to project E2. Uh, following the, the the space line, so if you project E two following uh, this uh, this direction to know what time corresponds to it, you see that the time is here. So the the time associated with E two in this frame is t prime two, and it turns out that t prime two now is smaller than the time associated with E one, which is t prime one. Before t two, so to know What's the time of the event two here? You have to you know, project following the, the, the space direction, the horizontal direction. You had T2 here, which was greater than T1. But now you have T2, T prime two here that is smaller than, uh, than T prime one. So in this frame, it looks like this event here is happening before this second event. But in this mm -hmm. frame, it's, it appeared that 
the second event is occurring before the the event one so, and that's why we say that's why we say that in uh, in relativity time is uh, uh, events are uh, the, the time the time ordering is relative you in one frame you you may think that this is occurring before that but in some other frame you find that that is occurring before this so uh, in one f so so again this you know this is something you you probably remember from your uh, your uh, your uh, university day um, so, so if you try to describe the propagation of a, of a particle in, in one frame, so you will have your particle, let's say it goes at, it goes there, uh, at T1, it, it, it undergoes some event, then it continues to propagate at T2, it has to undergo another event, and then it goes on. That's in this frame. But if you look at what's happening in, uh, in the other frame, what you find out is that uh, you have the particle that propagate up to T1, but before the event T1 occurred, you had somehow a creation of two particles, uh, or, or one particle here and an antiparticle here. This antiparticle propagate and, and annihilate at, uh, at event T1, and, uh, and the, the other particle that was created at T2 um, uh, propagate. Um, and uh, and uh, and and it and turned out to be the you know the the, the final uh, the final particle. So these two descriptions are quite different. Um, here you always have the same particle propagating. Here you have the particle that you thought was propagating in initially that is annihilated at T1, and it's another particle that ends up in the in the final state. So those type of graph. Uh, are called z graph for for some obvious reason, and um, and uh, when you try to describe um, the probability of the uh, partic particle propagating from here to there, you have to combine th those two possibilities because you, you can't be depending on which frame you choose, right? And um, so uh, maybe just to clarify something, you you may object that well here I had. The same particle that went from here to there, while well, here it's a different particle. But uh, in uh, in quantum in quantum field theory, an electron is an electron. You can't say this was a different electron from that. Uh, there's mm -hmm. no way to say it's, it's different. So th this, you know, the, the only thing you care is the initial state here, the final state here, and as far as nature is concerned, this initial state here and this final state here is the same. Uh, but if you want to compute the probability of going from here to there, you need to account for those those two possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the trouble is that uh, this type of of uh, this type of uh, probability is negative, uh, and uh, don't don't ask me what what the negative probability means, uh, but um, because because it's negative, it, it's decreasing this type of probability. Uh, I mean, the, the probability for, for this type of uh, of propagation. Um, so you need to compensate um, for, for for the negative pro probability because at the end you you you, you want this that would happen in, in say the, the the this this type of probability uh, should be independent of uh, whether the propagation is in the in in the time like region or in the the space like. Um, so you, you need to compensate for this negative probability. And the way to compensate for that is to add uh, a loop of a quantum loop of uh, um, particle antiparticle. So if, if you want to retain your, uh, your, uh, your, your a correct probability for, uh, for propagation, you need to, to add um, a loop of particle antiparticle, and that's how the, the complex structure of vacuum emerge uh, from uh, uh, from having event that can leak into the space space like region. Mm. So uh, maybe I, I can you know it was a long <laughs> explanation, and I I can now maybe summarize it going back to Figure Four. Yeah, sure. So. Um, so you see, you, let's say you you know you have an, a particle that propagates from E1 to E2, 
Okay, most of the time this is fine. It's a, it's a, a straightforward propagation. Uh, and sometimes you have fluctuation and your event T2 is here, or uh, sometimes your event is, is here. But sometimes you uh, would, would say we are not lucky and the event is there. Mm -hmm. Then when the event is there, you have two, two types of graphs to account for, the one where the propagation is straightforward and the one where you have a Z graph. But then you don't, you don't respect the what we call the, the principle of unitarity that says that the final uh, probability should be one for uh, for for uh, for uh, for an event to happen. So you need to add uh, uh, a quantum loop to compensate for the z-graph that has appeared as, as as soon as the the particle leaked into the, the space-like region, and that's uh, and that's this type of uh, vacuum loops uh, of of uh, uh, quantum vacuum loops of uh, particle and antiparticle that uh, that create the, the very complex structure of the vacuum when you uh, analyze quantum field theory using Galilean time. And um, so this is the, the, the origin of the, the complex structure of the of the vacuum. Now uh, Something that has been known for a long time is that if you um, if you consider uh, light from time instead of Galilean time, then you don't have a complex vacuum. You have uh, like a classical vacuum, uh, a vacuum without uh, um, a quantum loop of virtual particle inside. And this uh, this graph gives you a very intuitive expl uh, explanation for it. Uh, it's it. it it's immediate to see that you can never leak uh, if you quantify along the the, the, the constant uh, light code time. You can never leak into the space-like region, and because you never leak into the space special reg region, you don't get z-graph, and because you don't get z-graph, you don't get vacuum bubbles, uh, vacuum loops. Mm -hmm. So this is not the original demonstration the, the, for why the, the vacuum is is simple. Um, in uh, in light front uh, in the, in the light front framework, but that's that's a very intuitive way to to understand it. Well, at mm -hmm. least I find it intuitive. Yes, I think the explanation was really good. I, I think I get the intuition for at least uh, well the parts that we discussed now. So taking this one step further, also in the case of vacuum, because I believe uh, the part of the paper that addresses the the vacuum and the triviality of vacuum under LF dynamics also uh, makes the statement that under LF dynamics, uh, the cosmological constant would be predicted to be zero. That's right. Could you yeah. elaborate a little bit on that point? Because uh, specifically tying back to the, the early parts of the discussion, we said that um, we can choose whatever reference frame or consequently whatever um, definition of time that we want, but we still would have, we're still analyzing the same physical quantities and fine. Uh, it, we might have different interpretations of what a vacuum means in these two different frameworks, but something like the cosmological constant to me feels like a an intrinsic property of nature that wouldn't necessarily be um, affected by changes in our reference frame. That's my <laughs> understanding of it. Would you mind elaborating a little bit yeah, on why you're, we you're, have different predictions? You're you're, uh, you're exactly right. At the end, we should have the same prediction. So there's a there's a big debate on. You know what? What is going wrong? Is it going wrong at the on the you know the the, the traditional side? Is, are we missing something on the traditional side, or is it something that is somehow going wrong uh, in the the direct way, uh, the direct prescription of uh, of time? And the debate is mostly settled, um, but it's 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 not completely settled. So there there's still argument. Um, and um, so maybe um, maybe we, we should explain what what this has to do with uh, with the, the the vacuum uh, the, the cosmological constant. So mm -hmm. the the cosmological constant is uh, is is a quantity uh, that um, actually. Doesn't originate from quantum field theory. It originates from uh, general relativity, and it's a uh, it's a quantity that you're free to put in the in the equation of of general relativity. 
Um, originally, there was no good reason to do that. Um, and there's some famous story with Einstein doing it and then regretting doing it. And I'm sure everybody knows that. So there's no need to, to, to dwell on that. Uh, but um, for a long time, we thought, well, you know, that's something we are free to put, but there's no need to put one. Uh, so, and there's no, there's no evidence for one. So uh, let's set it to zero. Uh, and the effect of such a, such a constant, uh, such a cosmological constant in the, the equation of, uh, in the, in, in the Einstein equation would be that if, when you apply the, the Einstein equation to the evolution of the universe, this, uh, cosmological constant would act as, uh, some type of repulsive, uh, pressure, um, everywhere in the universe. So it will tend to, uh, uh, uh push things, uh, from, from uh, one one to another, it would it would tend to uh, to it would be a force that tend to make the the universe to to expand in contrast to the the usual force of gravity, which makes things to attract each other and and would tend to uh, to make the the universe to contract. So uh, until the turn of the the century, we we saw that the the universe was expanding. Um, because of uh, the initial expansion uh, at the Big Bang, uh, but but this is that this expansion was decelerating, so it was still expanding, but slower and slower and slower. And then in 1999, there was a, a, a really revolution in the, in our understanding of the of the evolution of the universe uh, with measurement of uh, of distant uh, supernova that told us that actually. Not only the universe is, is expanding, but it's expanding more and more and more rapidly. And that was, uh, very shocking because if you think of the universe as only made of matter, there's, there's nothing that can accelerate the expansion. As, as I said, matter always attracts each other. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, matter always attracts itself. So, it, so it should slow down the expansion, not accelerate it. So, uh, we had to find some reason for this accelerated expansion and the most, you know, the, the, the most natural, uh, simplest, uh, reason you can, you can find is this cosmological term that you can add to the equation. Um, so that's, that's the cosmological constant and it has now a, a solid, uh, phenomenological or observational basis thanks to those, uh, 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 large distance supernova um, uh, uh, observation. So that's one part. The, the other part is that uh, a, uh, a natural explanation for this cosmological constant would be the energy of the vacuum, the, the energy that comes from all those quantum loops inside the vacuum. So I said uh, earlier on that uh, we don't see those those, those loops because the, you know, the, the particle and antiparticle appear and quickly annihilate each other and you see nothing. So we, we, we may think that there's no consequence, uh, of, of this structure of the vacuum as far as we can observe no, no observable consequence. And that's true for uh, quantum field theory, but that's not true when you start to, to put, um, gravitation in the general relativity in the, in the picture. The reason is because uh, uh, everything uh, that has an energy has a mass. Oh, energy is equivalent to mass. So uh, this, the, the energy of do, those uh, little loops of particles uh, would uh, actually have a, a gravitational effect, which turned out uh, for uh, some particle to have an attractive effect and some other particle a type of field to have a, a, a repulsive effect. So the a, a very natural understanding of the origin of the cosmological constant are the gravitational effect of the energy momentum of those quantum loops, which are non-zero in the in the standard in the standard approach of uh, quantum field theory. So that's great. We have uh, you know we we're, uh, we we need. You know, we need from cosmology, we know we need a cosmological constant. From quantum field theory, we have a 
a really good candidate, uh, very natural candidate to explain how this, this, you know, the origin of this, uh, this type of uh, cosmological constant. But the problem arises when you try to compute it. Uh, when you try to compute it, you find a, a number, a number that is extremely large. Uh, uh, it's larger than uh, what is measured by about a, a one followed by 120 zero. So it's a, uh, it's not just an order of magnitude issue. It's a, uh, it, it's a complete failure of, uh, of the theory. So, uh, that's, uh, that, that's a big problem. And we had, we had several way around the, this, uh, this problem. Um, especially when we saw that the cosmological constant was zero. Um, and one of the solution of the problem was what was called supersymmetry, uh, the, the symmetry be between the, uh, the, which is an extension of, uh, of the, the of current understanding of quantum field theory. So supersymmetry would predict a zero cosmological constant. We don't, we don't want zero. We want a little bit, but zero is better than 10 with the uh, being off by 10 with the 119 zero. Um, so, uh, supersymmetry was a good way, uh, out of this, uh, this huge failure of the, the theory, um, except, you know, it would predict naturally zero, not, not a small number. So that, that was, uh, that was a, a problem, but, uh, probably a lesser problem than, uh, than, than the big failure, um, that, that I mentioned. The trouble is that, uh, supersymmetry should have been Detect, you know, supersymmetric particles should have been detected at the LHC, and uh, we, we are not seeing them. So most of the natu natural uh, explain uh, the, most of the natural uh, incarnation of supersymmetry are ruled out by the, the LH, L, LHC, and, and we, we don't think nature is, uh, is 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 following this type of uh, of theory anymore. So um, so this is this is mostly out. Uh, but another solution is to say, well, maybe we're missing something in the in the in the standard way of uh, of doing quantum field theory because if you do the other way, we find that actually the vacuum is trivial. You don't have those loops, so you don't have you don't have the the, the energy momentum acting acting on gravity. So your uh, your cosmological constant. If it originates from uh, quantum field theory, it would be zero. And so, so you you remove this problem. You, you still have to find the origin of the little bit, but at least it's not coming from what we know from quantum field theory. Now, the the question, your initial question was, how do we uh, recon reconciliate the, the two uh, the two view? Uh, and that's a very very difficult question. Which I don't think uh, anybody had a, had a good answer to. Uh, there are some. I mean, it's clear that the the standard picture is wrong because if it was true, if the cosmological constant was that large, well, the, the universe would have <laughs> would not be like it. You know, it, it it would have expanded so fast. We we would not be here to talk about it. So, um, so we we have to find what. What piece we're missing in the in the standard approach, and th there are there are candidates uh, to to try to to understand um, or, or to solve this problem, uh, but we're not. Uh, I don't think we have a very satisfactory answer. So in the paper, uh, we we do mention a couple of work that are using the standard. Uh, the standard approach and are showing how all those huge contributions may cancel to, to give a, a, a zero um, contribution from the vacuum. Uh, but my, uh, my perspective is a bit different. Uh, my perspective is that we, we, we have a, a very simple way to get the answer, which is using the, 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 the prescription prescription of Dirac to do quantum field theory. If I do the other one, I, I have to make a complicated calculation. And then I have to find why this complicated calculation is wrong and probably do another even more complicated calculation to 
you know, find the, find the, what is going to compensate the, mm -hmm. the, the, the first answer. So I, you know, I'm not very motivated to look for uh, what's going wrong when I have a much simpler way to, uh, to, to look at the problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the end, you're correct. We, we need to have the same answer. But I'm, I'm using the pragmatic way to say, well, the answer is easy to get using mm -hmm. light front quantization. And I, I really don't want to bother with the other one. Yes. Well, I guess it ties nicely to the to the conclusion of the paper as well, where you mention uh, the similarity between, let's say, um, well, the analogy to gravitation and whether or not you place uh, the Earth at the center of your conception of the universe now and um, how you would need to let's say at an exponential complexity rate, have to compensate for that if you're choosing the wrong reference frame. Right. So, uh, and it, it's something you find everywhere, right? You, mm -hmm. you you make a choice for your analysis, you make a, a, a choice of frame, and you're completely free of this choice. Uh, but there's smart choice and there's less smart choice. What, what uh, classical physics is telling you is that most of the time, most of the time, the smart choice is the initial inertial frame, the Galilean frame. Mm -hmm. It's most of the time that would be the best choice. That's what will minimize your um, your, uh, your calculation. That will give you the simplest uh, the, the simplest way to look at the problem, and that will also provide you with the minimal fundamental description of the problem. But it, it's not it's not foolproof, right? There's sometimes some yeah. advantage to uh, to use a rotating frame. Mm -hmm. So some people do that, and they're right to do that. Um, so it's you know it's not it's not a, it's not a, 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 a an absolute rule. Sometimes it's it's actually smarter to use a non-inertial frame, um, mm -hmm. but most of the time it's not. And uh, what we're trying to, to to say in the paper is that the same situation occur also in quantum field theory. For many, many problems, you have a great advantage in, in using the light font quantization. Maybe not for all problems, uh, but for most of the problems, especially the one dealing with uh, uh, the strong interaction, where it's really easy to, to get into very complicated calculation, there's, there's really a lot of advantage in, uh, in, uh, in using the, the, light, the light font frame rather than the standard, uh, the standard. Uh, frame with Galilean time. Mm -hmm. Understood. I think that ties up the the bulk of the paper quite nicely. I know that we're over time as well, um, oh, but okay. I would ask yeah. if there's anything else that we didn't touch upon that you would like to um, like mention before we close, because otherwise we'll close the interview. I think, uh, yeah, at this point. And I think we we covered all the all the all the good points. Uh, I maybe something I I, I need to. Emphasizes that in this paper, there's, it's a, what's new in the paper is the perspective. We try to give an intuitive perspective to a problem, you know, to, to something that has been around for 50 years. Um, so we're not, we're not saying anything new in terms of physics. Uh, for example, the, the fact that the, the, the vacuum is, uh, is trivial in, uh, in light front is something that had been known for a long time. We're, uh, so we're not saying, saying anything new on, on that front, what we're, uh, what, what's new is the perspective, the intuitive perspective that we're trying to provide uh, with this mm -hmm. paper. Mm -hmm. Very good. Then I would thank you very much for oh, thank you. stepping through the paper with me. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure. And uh, we can see I talked a lot because I like to talk about this. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> it's perfect. I'm happy you did. <laughs> <laughs>